saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everybody's having a great day today. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We'll see why rightly dividing is so important in today's study. Firstly, in reference to our study on Galatians, Paul would bring to memory his experience throughout the Galatian region in a letter written to Timothy approximately 16 years later in 2 Timothy 3 verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Now, of course, Paul knew full well, even early on in his ministry, even back in Damascus and his journey to Arabia, that persecution awaited him and he would have to suffer many afflictions in the future for preaching the gospel of grace, this mystery revealed to Paul by our Lord Jesus. Not only would Paul suffer trials and tribulations for his belief on Christ Jesus, but Paul would Paul wrote additional letters pertaining to the trials and tribulations and sufferings that the entire body of Christ would have to endure for our faith in Christ Jesus. Also, Jesus himself talked about this persecution that Paul would have to endure in the following verse. Here, Jesus is speaking to Ananias back in Acts 9 verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And we know from our study on the book of Acts that Ananias was a kingdom saint under the kingdom program, which would have made Ananias a member of the little flock. If you recall, the little flock was made up of believing Jews in Jesus' earthly ministry. And this little flock would receive a new shepherd once our Lord Jesus ascended to heaven. Jesus gave authority to the apostle Peter, making Peter the shepherd for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the kingdom program. So far in our study on Galatians, speaking about Paul's afflictions, we've seen that the bulk of Paul's persecution originated from this conflict between law-minded religious Jews and the gospel of grace revealed to Paul by our Lord Jesus. The majority of this conflict involved the Jews who were trying to convince the body of Christ back under the Mosaic system of laws, especially trying to convince believing Jews in the body of Christ to continue performing Mosaic traditions. Paul writes that the religious Jews were bewitching the body of Christ, manipulating believing Jews back under bondage, even going so far as to convince Gentiles to worship by means of performing Jewish rituals taking part in Jewish traditions, keeping the laws, and so on. Now remember, it's this law-mindedness that blinded the Jews from even realizing who Jesus was. He became a stumbling block to the nation of Israel. Now moving on, to refresh our memories on the last study, Galatians chapter 4, Paul addressed three points or three distinct topics concerning the Galatians. First, Paul addressed and clarified what he meant by being sons and heirs of God. Second, Paul expressed his concerns and his fears for the body of Christ in Galatia, especially his Jewish brethren. Third, Paul explained the difference between the two covenants, specifically the covenant made with Abraham concerning his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And we move on to our study today in Galatians chapter 5. Paul will again address three points in this letter. First, Paul will speak about our liberty in Christ Jesus, our freedom from bondage under the law. Second, Paul will explain how love fulfills the law. Third, Paul will discuss walking 
and living in the spirit two very important topics for us to understand in the body of Christ now beginning today's study on chapter 5 remember when we rightly divide we need to ask the questions who what where when why and how and if you've noticed Paul has been talking a lot about Jewish history their origin going back all the way to Abraham Isaac and Jacob and so on of course we know Paul is addressing the body of Christ in Galatia in the specific language and and analogies and history that Paul's using in his letter is meant to address obviously his kinsmen the Jewish believers in Galatia they're the primary group of people who were being bewitched or manipulated back under the yoke of bondage Tra Jewish laws and traditions lost Gentiles at the time were mostly worshiping idols they were pagans or whatever they worshiped but it certainly for the most part was not in the God of Israel Gentiles weren't the primary group being manipulated back under the law they were never under the law to begin with it was the believing Jews who were primarily being attacked here remember back in Acts 10 the vision that Peter had about clean and unclean animals that vision was all about the separation between Gentiles and Jews the Gentiles were considered unclean they were kept separate from the nation of Israel and that includes their traditions their laws and feasts and holy days and so on and if you look back at what we study so far in Galatians Paul's letter has been about Israel and their history so what exactly is going on here in Paul's letter to Galatia this the conflict we've been reading about thus far is concerning the Jews who had been saved added to the body of Christ under Paul's ministry but they were being convinced bewitched manipulated back into the practice of their Jewish traditions under the laws for example uh, circumcision unbelieving Jews were trying to get the believing Jews in the body of Christ to continue the practice of circumcision adhering to the Mosaic laws and traditions again going back under bondage and some believing Jews just couldn't let their mosaic traditions go they continue to practice what they've always known but the problem with that was they were placing themselves back under the yoke of bondage as Paul calls it and also trying to convince Gentile believers that they too had to observe certain Jewish rituals so knowing this by right division we know who Paul is addressing and why he's addressing them and keep keep this in mind Paul is addressing the body of Christ in Galatia with special attention to the Jewish believers that's why we see Paul bring up so much of the Jewish history in his letter obviously the Jews would understand what Paul was talking about the Gentiles uh, well not so much so in our study on chapter 5 to pick up the context of what Paul was writing about let's start back in Galatians 4 in verse 28 now we brethren as Isaac was are the children of promise okay Paul obviously is addressing Jewish believers here but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit even so it is now nevertheless what saith the scripture cast out the bondwoman and her son for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman so then brethren we are not children of bondwoman but of the free it's obvious from the verses that I just read that Paul is addressing the Jews here he's speaking about Israel's history now Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage Firstly, notice the word again. Okay, the word again gives us a clue who Paul is addressing primarily. In order to be placed under the yoke of bondage again, they would have had to be placed under bondage previously, right? That makes that's, that's just logical sense. So, 
which group of people in the body of Christ were once under the yoke of bondage, under the law? Well, of course, it's the Jews. So it's clear here in the very first verse that Paul is addressing his believing kinsmen, his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And this is rather important to understand because it's all part of the overall context of the book of Galatians. And it's part of rightly dividing God's word. It's very important. Also, Paul says to stand fast. What does he mean by stand fast? Well, here in verse 1, Paul is telling his Jewish brethren, members of the body of Christ, free from religious traditions, free from bondage, and placed in the liberty of Christ Jesus. Paul is telling them to stay in that liberty and not go back to the Mosaic religious system, the bondage. The Greek word used here for stand fast, stiko, from where we get the phrase stand fast, Stiko means to stand firm, to persevere, to persist, to keep one's standing. Paul says to stand fast, stay firm, persevere, persist in the liberty we have in Christ Jesus. The Galatians were being tricked out of their liberty, back to being servants, back to keeping the commandment laws, back to worshiping on certain days, back under bondage, back to their, their Ju Judaic traditions. Again, these are all terms familiar to the Jewish brethren. Paul speaking to the body of Christ, but he's addressing the specific problem the Jewish brethren were having at the time. Galatians 5 verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now recall from our previous study on Galatians chapter 3 in verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Speaking about the Jews here shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed what was revealed the mystery revealed to paul wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto christ that we might be justified by faith but after that faith has come we are no longer under a schoolmaster for ye are all the children of god by faith in christ jesus again Paul uses language that the Jewish brethren could understand. They could relate to it. The Gentiles didn't know what it was like to be under a system of laws, but the Jews did. Keep in mind why Paul is writing this letter and to whom he's addressing and for what reasons in particular. Galatians 5 verse 5, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? If you recall why circumcision was used in the first place, it was a covenant between God and Abraham. And it was to make the Jews a unique people upon the earth to separate them from everyone else, both spiritually and by physical appearance, and also by their daily activities. Paul reminds them that circumcision or uncircumcision means nothing in the body of Christ because there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is no separation. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Remember in our study in Galatians chapter 3, in in uh, verse 28 there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for ye are all one in Christ Jesus one problem taking place in Galatia was that certain Jewish believers were once again trying to make themselves distinct okay and this distinction was creating division within the body of Christ in verse 8 this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord 
that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whoever, whosoever he be. Paul's telling them not to pay attention to whoever is spreading this false teaching, that the body of Christ you know, also needed to adhere to works and laws and Jewish traditions and so on. In verse 11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off would trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Paul uses the phrase, walk in the spirit. How do we walk in the Spirit? What does Paul mean by walk in the Spirit? Well, how to walk in the Spirit and how to live in the Spirit, another phrase Paul uses, is a study in itself, and a very important one, I might add. In fact, so important that I made a complete study on walking and living in the Spirit. And the study can be found on my channel. The title of the video is Walking in the Spirit versus Living in the Spirit. I highly suggest you take the time to watch that video. It's going to answer the question of how you should be walking and living in the Spirit as a member of the body of Christ. It's not a long video. I think it's only about 20 minutes long. Galatians 5 verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Paul mentions this battle that we face, a spiritual battle, one between the flesh and the spirit, being at odds with each other. Our flesh is corrupt, and the Holy Spirit is holy. So all of us have to deal with this battle on a daily basis until this purchased possession is redeemed. In Ephesians 1.12, we read about that redemption, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, speaking of the body of Christ here, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard, heard what? The gospel, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest, the down payment, the promise of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Furthermore, about nine years later, Paul would write about his personal battle between his flesh and the spirit in a letter to the Romans. In Romans 7:15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So, Paul talks about his personal battle with the flesh. And this is something that we all can relate to. Galatians 5.18 But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, uh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, 
uh, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, Paul will switch from the fallen state of our flesh and his flesh over to the fruit of the Holy Spirit that seals us in Christ Jesus in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Recall a verse in Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Hath before ordained God creating the body of Christ mystery before the foundation of the world, that we, the body of Christ, would be his instrument or the means by which good works could be performed through us by his Holy Spirit. This verse does not say we need to do good works to get saved or to keep our salvation, which is a common perversion of what the verse, uh, how some false teachers twist it. What Paul is saying here is this, once we're saved, then we're given the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit to perform good works. It's only through the Holy Spirit that we can truly live and walk in the Spirit. It's definitely not by our own power or strength. It comes from Christ Jesus alone. Okay, so we've covered a lot of important things in this study. Please take advantage of the link that I provided concerning how to live and walk in the Spirit. Peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I'll see you all again for our last study on Paul's letter to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 6.